Welcome into the Alana Inquirer podcast, the Sweet 16 version with Mike Latulip, our Alana Inquirer basketball analyst. How's that sound, Mike? Illinois finally back here after 19 years. Sounds great. It's got a ring to it, right? Yeah, I feel like 2013, we were close. You know, we had a Kenny Kaji tipped ball that potentially could have gone our way, should have gone our way if there was under two minute review, but we didn't get it done. And thankfully, these guys here in 2024 have have done it. And it's just been, man, it's been such a blast, even just up to this point, covering this team. And um, you still feel like there's meat on the bone. Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel like this is a destination, the Sweet 16. It feels like it's it's part of the journey for these guys. I got a question for you later about that. Um, but I, I want to focus on why, why is this team? Why is this the team? that was able to get here of all these. I mean, your team in 2013 was a really good team. We're so close to getting there. 2021. We know 2022 tough draw with Houston, but why was this the team to get there? Uh, this could be a really long answer, but I'll give you the shorter version of it. I just think this team's ability to, to shape shift throughout the season. I mean, on the one hand you have, you play Oakland and Marquette, in back-to-back games earlier in the season and score 64 points. And at that point, let's just say, let's just stick offensively. You know, you start off with these more like spread and open concepts. And then eventually you get to the point of going to more booty ball and back downs with Damask. And then, oh my gosh, what are you going to do with Ty Rogers? And then you move Ty Rogers and make him more of a five man, put him in screening actions, get him more involved to, to make these other teams pay for it. And then as the season goes on, you keep having different iterations of this offense. Like just, just here in March, we've seen these staggers with Terrence Shannon where it's, hey, let's get Terrence on the move a little bit where we can set a stagger for him. If he comes off, great. If he rejects it, we pop tie. We swing it to tie, get tie into a dribble handoff of Marcus Damas. Like this, you know, it's not like they just came into the season and had this offense and we're off to the races. They've evolved. And the only way that you can evolve is, is one, if you have the players that can do it, and two, if you have like the mental makeup of those players to do it. Because you made a major shift in the season to go to back downs and go to booty ball, and that booty ball was not putting the ball in the hands of Terrence Shannon. It was putting the ball in the hands of Marcus Damask. And there are a lot of guys that are in Terrence Shannon's position that would have a problem with that, and yeah. Terrence Shannon doesn't. And that's that's why you can be the team that you are is because of those type of guys. Those guys are about winning. And you go on down the line, right? When you have a guy at the top like that, Terrence, and, and I'll throw Marcus in there too. Like Marcus is about ball. Marcus is about winning. Now when all these other guys, when Quincy Garrier gets shelved for 16 minutes against Indiana, when Ty Rogers gets shelved for the last 12 minutes against Northwestern, um, those guys don't have issues. Like they don't become a problem. Dre Gibbs Lawhorn stays ready. Knocks down big shots against against Moorhead State. Has a great showing in the Big Ten tournament. Dane Danger stays ready, right? Like you, we can talk about you know what they did defensively, where you're switching one through five, then you go into to drop, where you're keeping matchups. Now you're more selectively switching. That's evolved. You cannot evolve like that and make those changes without this like these types of guys that are willing to do that and keep the the main thing the main thing, which is is it going to help us win? Great, let's do it. And that is why they're where they are right now is because of all those all those changes, but but the mental makeup of this team. You know, until you get to get to a Sweet Sixteen, like there's all these questions about Brad Underwood and the NCAA tournament. But I'm just thinking about when they hired him. I was thinking, did they find their John Beeline, the schematic wonder, uh, who's going to find these under recruited guys and develop them into all Big Ten, all American types, and, and runs this system, the spread system. You know, like just kind of the system schematic guy. And, and I think back of one of Underwood's best strengths is his ability to change, his ability to pivot, whether it's in season, thinking about what he runs or just getting talent and changing what he does to that talent. Uh, I, I think he's evolved a lot as a coach here. And I think it all leads to this, Mike, whether it's the offense, who he went and got in the off season after, you know, trying different things the last couple of years of personnel, I, I think this is a culmination for Brad Underwood and, and his ability to to check the ego at the door and 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 you know change to what he needs to win, whether it's in the Big Ten to get Kofi and Io and change based on that, or whether it's hey we need to win the NCAA tournament, how do we get there? 
Yeah, no, he's he's done about just as good a job as anybody at doing that. I mean, I think he does such a good job of molding game plan and scheme around his personnel. And that's not easy to do year after year. There's a ton of stubbornness out there in college basketball of coaches that are like, here's my system, get players in, players, you know, jam them into that system. And if you can't fit that system, you can't play. Or if you can't fit that system, now we got to go get other guys that do. And we've had these these different iterations of, of teams and that came in. You know, the first couple of years that Brett Under was here, those teams weren't very talented. So what did they do? They had to turn you over. They had to get India. They had to deny passing lanes. They had to do all these little things to try to steal possessions. And then you get Kofi Coburn and then you get Io Desumu. And it's like, hey, we have Io, but we kind of have to play four out one in with Kofi and just play off the gravity that he creates. And then Kofi leaves. And then last year you have more, you know, middle of the season last year where they kind of turned things around because it was it was bleak there in non-conference. They went to more of the spread concepts and and played more, you know, with Coleman at, you know, at that, you know, um, whatever extended elbow spot. And that was what they did pretty much the rest of the season. And now you get, you know, after that 22-23 season, you shifted who you go after yep. it's let's go get some mid-major guys that are hungry that just want to win and that i think is permeated and there's just there just aren't a ton of coaches that do that or you know it's, it's been widely covered the conversation that brad underwood had with jay wright mm-hmm. after the the tennessee game and some coaches would be like well what if i adopt jay wright's way of thinking and then if we're super successful everyone credits jay wright who cares Right. Just go and win. And I talk about all these guys being about winning. It starts at the top because that's what the staff's about. That's what Brad's about. That's, that's you know, that's even the only holdover since I've been there is Fletch. And if I know one thing about Fletch, Fletch is about winning too. And those guys spent a lot of time with him as well. So it is a, it's across the department, if you will, there. So on top of the, the Big Ten success, what does this mean for the program? Just to get back here, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I think – it, it reinforces the success, the success that the program's had over the last five years. It's just, you know, we do this weird thing with the NCAA tournament. We've talked about it, right. Where, you know, the difference between this game and that game is the difference between, you know, generalizing whether or not this guy's a good coach or not a good coach, or this team's a good team or not a good team, or, Hey, this team's who we thought they were, or Hey, this team surprised us. Um, We even see the narratives throughout the tournament now where it's like, the Big Ten goes three and zero, oh, and the ACC goes six and one right now. And it's like, well, did we underestimate these conferences? And uh, or the SEC is a horrible conference. And um, but for this program, once you get to this Sweet Sixteen, it's a bigger stage, man. I mean, the eyes that are on you from high school recruits to guys in the portal to NBA scouts. We always think back to, uh, I think it was, I think it was twenty fourteen, where uh, or twenty fifteen when. Michigan State made the run to the Final Four, and then all of a sudden Denzel Valentine and, and Travis Trice are getting NBA looks because they just got to that stage and played their game, and and so everyone benefits when you when you get to this this stage. So it means a lot to the program. It means a lot to the fans. I mean, there are I can you see people on social media where there's like 22 year old kids that don't remember a Sweet 16. They don't remember 05 because they were three years old, right? And so. That that type of stuff is there's lasting memories across the board for the team, for the staff, for the players, for for the fans. And, you know, I hope there's a really good showing out in Boston because you, know, you just never know. I mean, you know, you never know how many times it's going to happen. I think after 05, there's no way anyone thought it was going to be 19 years. Yeah, I would think, Mike, a Big Ten tournament championship, 28 wins. Uh, a sweet 16. That's a successful season uh, for basically yeah. anybody. Uh, but now it's time to get greedy because an elite eight is an elite season. Obviously yeah. uh, a final four is one of the best seasons ever uh, in, in Illinois history. So uh, now, now it's time for this team, I would imagine to, to go get greedy, but what impressed you most? Uh, what, what makes you think they can, uh, you know, advance after that dominance uh, against Duquesne? Yeah. Well, the Duquesne game in particular, just that game was over in the first minute and a half. And you could tell just just watching it, the disposition these guys had, just the you know the importance I think they put on that game. Not in in I say that, and you're like, well, hey, it's the round of 32 to get to the Sweet 16. There's plenty of teams where if you don't have the right mental makeup, like I referenced earlier in the pod, 
it's exhale. We got Duquesne, you know, could have had BYU. We get the 11 seed and then you get popped. Like we've seen teams do that year after year after year. And they came in and, and when you had all these games over the past, even in the postseason alone where you've got down and climbed back, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case in this game. They stepped on them and stepped on them from the beginning. And uh, you know, I, like what was the game plan going into it? We talked about it. Take those two guards away. They did that right off the bat. Terrence Shannon, I thought was incredible to start that game on the defensive end. And we can, you know, we'll talk about obviously what what he's done to this point. But you took care of business, and and the maturity within that goes a long way because you win a you win a Big Ten tournament. All this talk about do you want to win it do you want to you know go far in it rest this and that hey isn't it cool winning a big 10 tournament and then going to a sweet 16 yeah. just yeah. like we talked about where that has been the history with the champions for that team um you know i've talked to i, I was you know talking the other day to to hummel about this and he's like dude I, I in 2010 that like springboarded us into a sweet 16 winning the big 10 tournament because I don't, I don't think they were a one seed that year but they were able to win that and it got them feeling good. I mean, all that stuff matters. So, you know, I, I, that's what I've been most impressed with, with this team was last year, didn't have the maturity to be able to turn the page, didn't have the maturity to, you know, turn the page after a loss, but turn the page after a win as mm -hmm. well, where you, you have that whole celebration after the big 10 tournament. And now you got to reset and do it again for the, for the NCAA tournament. They've done a hell of a job of that. All right, let's weigh on this fun topic. Um, <laughs> Because it's kind of ridiculous that that two of the last superstars, and and we're not even talking about a third one in Kofi Coburn, but is Terrence Shannon Jr. having the best season ever for Illini? Uh, and, and why or why not? I mean, obviously Io Desumu, Kendall Gill would be in this, Nick Anderson would be in this, but it really comes down, I think, to, to Io and Terrence the last couple of years. Not to mention Kofi and his consensus first team All American season. We we talked about this a little bit before Moorhead, yeah. right? And I was wavering. Me too. I was wavering a tad. I'm there. I'm there. I think it's, I think it's the best ever. Um, and, you know, granted you'll have, I, I had somebody tweet at me the other day and CC'd me and asked if this was the best Illini season. It said, Taryn Shannon's having the best Illini season since. And I said, ever. Yeah. But you see everyone chiming in and you can tell different eras will think different, you know, People that are more recent or like you can't forget about Io. People that are, you know, more from the 80s era are like Nick Anderson and Kendall Gill and, um, yeah. you know, D Brown and Darren Williams. And uh, I just think that, you know, when you have an All-American already and and I get he was third team. This, he's a first team All-American. Um, I feel I feel pretty confident saying that you have a first team all American, you have a first team all big 10 guy. And honestly, you have a big 10 player of the year. If he doesn't overlap with a generational big man. Right. Um, right. Like I think he would have at least had one of those. He definitely would have gotten it this year. If Zach Eady were to have moved on to the NBA, to the NBA last season, but you know, how do you weigh it? And, and you can't, you can't reference all the time. Cause people talk about all oh, legends are made in March and um, postseason this and postseason that. I honestly got, I mean, he's doing, this is one of the, the best postseason runs that I think I've seen from a player of any bit of line eye history. Like Kemba. Like right. That, it's, that's it's, about it. Right. Like, yeah, it's similar. Um, and so it's a line eye history, big 10 history. I mean, college basketball. I mean, this is, you're talking about a guy that in five games on the way to a conference tournament championship and then past the first weekend is, you know, I think 53% from the field, 41 from three and 88 from the line average, you know, whatever it is, 30 points a game. I, it's, it's crazy. And then what he's doing defensively as well. It's just, you know, it is, you know, and that's not to take away from the other Illini. Cause that's, I think that's what you fall into it is like, I can, yeah, I can make the comment of this is the best Illini season that I've, that I've seen. And that's probably ha taken place without discrediting what those other guys did. Cause you know, unfortunately for Kofi and IO, they kind of cancel each other out. Yeah. Right. You know, you could look at it both ways where it's like a Kobe Shaq thing where, okay. You know, everybody was reluctant to give it solely to Kobe cause he had Shaq and everybody was you know reluctant to give it to Shaq because Shaq had Kobe. And, and that's kind of the, 
cross you bear when you have two really good guys like that, where when you look at the Ken Palm National Player of the Year rankings from that year, they were six and seven, that which is pretty insane. So, you know, I look, what are your thoughts? Because you were wavering, you were wavering yeah, too. No, I, I guess you, you had Io last time we going in going into the tournament. I said I would still go with Io at this point because better distributor. Um, I thought just the leadership of, of Io was, was next level. Um, but I did think Terrence is a better defender. I, I, I thought had more to give defensively that season. I said, the one thing that opens the door is if Shannon gets to a sweet 16, that might be the Trump card, um, that, that he gets in over him. I was just looking up Kemba's postseason numbers from 11, Mike, uh, 11 straight wins to close that postseason, 24.6 points a game. Uh, 43% from the field. Terrence is what, 50? And then three-pointers, 24% from the field. Just put that in perspective. Terrence is averaging 31 a game, right? Like, it, if you if he gets to a Final Four, Mike, like we're talking about Terrence Shannon in that Kemba-level postseason territory. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree, man. I mean, I think it's – you've you've kind of just felt it building in the Big Ten tournament and then into this tournament. And, yeah, I mean, he just – he hasn't blinked. And and that is that is what's so crazy because like we, I, I'm not even kidding you. I I think back to that Arkansas game last year in the NCAA tournament. I I don't even remember Taryn Shannon until like the last ten like five and, minutes maybe. Yeah, last five minutes they started getting going a little bit, started hitting some shots. But like for, by and large in that game, you, you don't remember a lot of Illinois players from that game. RJ Melendez had like a little run there in the second half, but other than that, it was it was a pretty forgettable game and. Yeah, no, it's it's a it really is like a generational type of run, um, you know. And, and what's crazy is simultaneously you have Zach Eady kind of doing the same thing, like in the NCAA tournament at least. Is you know his his numbers for the first two games are like Shaq and you know David Robinson and maybe one other person that's that's done it. So I you know as much as Purdue and Illinois fans want to go back and forth, I think it's it's pretty darn cool you get these two guys overlapping at the same time because I don't know it just makes it. It just makes it more fun. And, and the last thing I'll say too, and this is again, um, I wish we would have had like Io and Luca to have that kind of tournament success. You know yeah, I mean? and and I, it, like with Io, and I, I'm just, I'm trying to paint a picture here. Like I, I love Io to death. I think oh, yeah. he's he he's a big reason why this program even got back to the point that it was at. It was it was him. It was not yeah. only him make, deciding to come to Illinois, but staying at Illinois. I still mentioned this in my mailbag. Somebody asked me who the best player of the Underwood era is. I said I still went with Io just because he's the most important player. He played here yeah. three years. I would have taken sophomore year Io over last year Shannon. Um, but this year it's just Shannon's having the best single seed. I, j I just think at this point that's what it is. But yeah, he's still the reason this is what it is. Yeah. I think it gets a lot. Yeah. It gets the, the argument kind of gets convoluted where we're talking single season and they said, you know, one seed, this and that. I mean, the, fortunately or unfortunately, like once you get to that point of having a one seed, you know, you're up so high that that fall is even harder when you lose to a, to a Loyola and, and just going back and watching that game and even looking at like, I would not play well that game. No. Like I was, Iowa was not good in that game. Lucas uh, Burns did not outplay him. Yeah, and 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 even even in the Big Ten title game, right? I think Iowa was five for seventeen from from the field, and Curbelo was great late. Obviously, you know Kofi Kofi had you know was was um, got going as well. But that team was so talented. Um, you, you go back and look, and you're like, geez. I mean, the guy that you forget about sometimes is freaking Trent Frazier. Mm -hmm. And and how could you forget about Trent and like what Jacob did on that team and um, so I, I don't want to like I said I don't want I don't want to minimize what Io did because I don't you could argue you know Illinois might not even be in a Sweet Sixteen right now if it's not for Io just with, with the importance that he had to this program it's just single season I I still can't wrap my head around the fact that he broke the single season scoring record and missed six games yeah and he's <laughs> I mean, he's, I mean, adding, he's adding to it. It's insane. Like, yeah, I mean, you're talking about like another what, 120, 130 points added to that if he plays in those games. It's just, it's crazy. But it's a sign of the times because the fact that you even in the last five years, it's not like we're just solely debating Terrence Shannon and Kendall Gill. It's like you have that era, you have 05, and you have the you know the early 2020s where you can you're even 
throwing in single season stuff for guys that played three years ago here. That's right. It's just, you know, Kofi and Io, it's, I don't know. It's a hell of a run. Sign of the times, man. All right, Mike, here we go. Sweet 16 matchup. You get the number one offense in the country, Illinois, against the number one defense in the country in Iowa State. I think this and Creighton, Tennessee are the matchups I'm most looking forward to in the Sweet 16 here. So what do you think of this Illini offense against this Cyclones pressure defense? Feels like that's the story of the game here. It's an insane Sweet 16 matchup. Yeah. It, it really is. I think it's just it's really rare to get number one face off with number one in in this uh you know in this type of game. But um, you know, it's it should be a lot of fun. I think you know when you're watching Iowa State, and there's a lot of talk about their defense, rightfully so. Uh, they're still a good offensive team. I mean, this isn't one of this isn't one of those things where it's like, hey, if we just play well offensively, we'll win this game. You you're you're gonna have you're going to have to guard them and you're going to have to limit them to one shot and get out, get out and transition. Um, but, but sticking to their defense specifically. And I think what you'll see when you watch them is there's kind of a misnomer for, for, you know, the Houston's of the world, the Iowa States of the world, like those, those teams that are in the upper echelon defensively and the natural inclination is to think that those type of teams are like, gosh, they're just so principle oriented and they're in the right spot every time it's almost the opposite for, for Iowa state. I mean, what they do defensively is almost complete and utter randomness okay. and, and it causes confusion. It causes chaos. And, and it really, that, that is what I think bothers a lot of teams offensively when they play them, because, you know, the way that they, you know, they'll have certain principles, right? You know, if you're going to back downs and you're Marcus DeMass, the guy will flip his feet, he'll force you to the baseline He'll corral you there. That's where they do a lot of their traps. They trap a lot out of ball screens at times. But you'll see sometimes it's just it's on the players. It's like the player's jurisdiction to determine whether or not they're going to trap. And there's this like spatial awareness that they have defensively where, you know, if I'm baseline out of bounds and I inbound it and you want to you want to get it to the ball side corner and the big man that's guarding the baseline out of bounds guy, if he's close enough, he'll just go trap. I mean, and that's. That may be a principle of theirs. It might not because you can see when you're watching him, he wants to like run away, but he realizes that he's close enough to go trap. So he runs over and that's, that's what you have. I mean, though, the one thing you have to, I mean, there's a lot of things you gotta, you gotta recognize when you're playing them. Where is Taman Lipsy and where is Sean Gilbert? Like, where are those guys? Because they will go completely off script. They will roam and they will go completely out of position I mean, I'll give one example here. I mean, this is this is why they're tough to play against. I'm on the left wing and I'm getting a ball screen on a cleared side. So it's me and a big man and I'm coming off going towards the middle of the floor. You got a big man rolling to the basket. So what's going to happen is you have the ball screen defender that's guarding you. And when I hit that pocket pass to that big man, it's going to prompt a guy from the weak side on the bottom to rotate over, right? That's what usually happens. So now you have that, you know, once you hit that big man, now that big man can maybe skip and now you're playing out of it. You'll see on the film, Keyshawn Gilbert will be guarding the weak side corner and he will move himself all the way over to the ball side block mm. and just stand there. And you'll throw a bounce pass right into his lap because that that is poor principles by him. But that's what they do. I mean, that that is they will completely mess you up. And if you want to predetermine reads they'll they'll just steal the ball so you have like it's it's about simplifying things when you're playing against them but that's that's where these teams get you is you come in you're like it's this number one defense and where are they coming from and you just you overthink things and you beat and you play sped up so you have to simplify the game right because you'll see on the film like you come off you drive down the lane if gilbert wants to stand right where the roll man is and his guy is in the opposite corner you just keep your head up. There will be a wide open guy in the opposite corner. I mean, they give up the rate of threes that they give up to field goals attempted. It's one of the highest in the country. Like you will get three point shots. It's just yeah. the quality that matters. So what's the key for a guy like Marcus Damask, who's got to be making those decisions, Mike, uh, in the keys for guys playing off him? Yeah, I think luckily for, for Illinois, they're not compared to a lot of other teams in college basketball and compared particularly to a lot of teams in the Big 12. They're not a heavy ball screen team. Yeah. Like that's not their main form of offense like it is for a lot of teams. And that's where that's where Iowa State can get you a lot of times. But what they are is a back down, you know, Marcus Damask, booty ball type of team. So he's going to see a ton of traps. 
he's going to see a ton of doubles. And the doubles that he's going to see are arguably unlike any doubles that he's seen Correct. this year. So, like, he's got to be really good. He's got to be really good. And the other point that I'll make, too, and I'll touch on this in the film, is – I, and I've talked about this over the course of the past few weeks, but when you're Marcus Damask and you're backing down on that wing, okay, and that second guy comes, he's going to come from under the basket, okay? So when you get that second guy to, to, to rotate over and you throw it out to Coleman Hawkins' ball side, it has got to be a race to get that ball to the opposite wing, to the opposite corner for, for three-point shots, for driving long closeouts. You, you'll you see the second you catch and look, it's over. Mm. They've rotated out. They've squared back up. And now you're, you're putting yourself in a position to potentially take a tough shot to finish out the shot clock. So you'll see Houston at times would do it where they rotated out. And instead of rotating it around the arc, they went right back into the help. You just – you got to find those creases. And honestly, you got to be ready. You just got to be ready to shoot the ball. And you got to be ready to 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 play in general. That's why my X factor for this one is Coleman. Like that, that yeah. get out the ball, top of the key, whether it's shoot, pass, or, or drive that lane, Mike. I, I just feel like he's going to be massive here because he's going to have pressure on him too, but he's also going to have, I think, a lot of offensive opportunities in this one. No, he is. He's he's a big part of this game. And, and um, you know, I'll give you an, another X factor here in a second. But, yeah, I mean, the the way that they play out of those doubles is, is to me, the game. Um, but you could also argue too that the game is how they fared defensively mm -hmm. against Iowa State. Because if you're not guarding against Iowa State, they don't have offensive zeros. You know, they, they have they have guys that can play. Uh, and so you put that much more strain on your offense when you're not getting stops. And when you're not getting stops, you can't get out in transition. And when you can't get out in transition, like that's where I think this Iowa State defense is susceptible in some areas. But look, like and even on the defensive end, right? It's 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 Lipsy, it's Gilbert, it's keeping those guys out of the paint because those guys are wrecking balls when they get into the paint. They'll draw fouls. Gilbert in particular will shot fake you to death, get you up on your feet, try to get to the line. Um, you just you got to be aware of that. And then both of them, Lipsy and Gilbert, take more shots off the dribble than they do catch and shoot. And for comparison, Taron Shannon's taken about 60 more shots catch and shoot than off the dribble this year. Part of that's a product because of how many ball screens they set. That's that's a, a big function of their offense. Like you'll see, depending on which big is in. So if it's Hassan Ward, they're going to do a lot of ball screen, rim run, lobs. When it's Robert Jones, they'll play through him a little bit more. Like he's a better passer. They'll you know have him on the perimeter. They'll they'll go five out. They'll go dribble handoffs. They'll go zoom actions. They'll so they play in a variety of ways, and they're 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 good on that end. And then the last person I'll mention is Momchilovich. Like yeah. I, I honestly like he's a freshman. I think he's their best offensive player. Like he's a stud, man. He's he's an absolute pro. So you got you just got to be aware with those guys um, because it's not it's not just what how you fare against them on the offensive end and taking care of the ball and all that stuff. You you got to guard them uh, to to you know not put that type of strain on your offense. Yeah, so, I mean, ball screens, they've struggled uh, against guards like that, Mike. So is, is there anybody in the Big Ten you kind of compare their offense to? Because, I listen, I, I, have, I have doubts of whether Iowa State can score into the 80s uh, against Illinois, if they can keep up with that pace. But, I mean, Penn State did, right? Like, so Illinois does have to bring it defensively still. Yeah, it is. Honestly, it is kind of like Penn State. I mean, mm -hmm. Penn State will run a lot of high ball screens, double drags. I mean, they'll run that that type of stuff, and then they'll try to create – some havoc defensively. Now Iowa State is, right. you know, ten times the team that that Penn State is. Uh, so you just got to be aware of that. You got to fight over ball screens. You got to square these guys up. You got to get, you know, if they're going to take shots off the bounce, you got to be able to rear view contest all the things that we've talked about throughout the season. But I'll give you another. I'll give you another X factor for this game is Dane Danger, mm -hmm. because I think it's a game that he can play it. And and you know, why that's so important is not about the offensive end. It's about the defensive end because I just mentioned Momchilovic and how, how good he is. He's 6'8", and he does a lot of what Damas does because all these he, – he will post smaller wings in the Big 12, and my God, is he skilled. Uh, fadeaways, spin moves. I mean, he's got it all, and he, he hits it at such a high rate. I think that's, that's, that's Coleman. Coleman could, could draw that matchup. It may not be right off the bat, 
mm-hmm. because you got some of those other bigs Coleman probably has to guard. But I think at some point, Dane Danger being in there will shift Coleman over to Momchilovich. And, and that is, you know, that's a matchup that you feel pretty good about because you get more length on him to, to be able to contest some of the tough shots that he takes. So I'm looking at Dane to, to be an X factor, but Marcus Damask and Terrence Shannon got to be, got to be X factor. Like if they're, if those two aren't good, I, I don't see you making it to an elite eight. So um, it's amazing at this point, like you play these good at teams, like it's not just two guys playing well, you got to have a lot of guys on their P's and Q's. Well, and what a weekend for Dane, right? 13 to 13 from yeah. the field following a really good big 10 tournament. It's been, been awesome to see it. It just, as you said, Mike, it allows him to be more versatile. No, I agree. And I, I think once again, if you're any of these teams prepping for Illinois, you're watching Dane Danger, and you're like, this is a backup big. <laughs> this is I mean, it's probably all these teams are like, man, this is this would be our starting big, most likely. It's just Illinois is that talented offensively. Um, to have a guy that can come in like that and be a complete change up with kind of how you play and how you defend, it's um, you know, he's uh he's making a name for himself. Like he's, you know, for a guy that was playing really limited minutes different at different points in the season to have him be able to kind of get his footing and put on this type of performance in March is, is pretty incredible. All right, Mike, I'm, if I'm a Illini fan, I'm concerned about the pressure defense and how Illinois handles that. Um, we talked about the things Iowa State does, but if I'm Illinois, I feel really good that I have the best player on the court, uh, potentially two of the best players on the court with him in Damask, uh, but also just maybe, maybe the front court and the way it's playing with Dane Danger there. So, I'm not asking for a score prediction or anything, but how do you see this one kind of going? Well, let's let's talk about the the teams that have had success against Iowa State this year and how they've won. I mean, a lot of times I'll just I'll I'll kind of go piece by piece here, but the teams that have had success, you're either taking care of the ball or you're making threes or both. Right? I think for this Illinois team, if you aren't taking care of the ball, you better be making threes. You better be making outside shots. If you're not making outside shots, you better be taking care of the ball. If you're not doing either, you are going. You're it's gonna be a short trip yep. to Boston. Um, so those things you you definitely have to be aware of. Um, and then I think you know part of the you know I, I just mentioned being able to limit them one and done on on the defensive end for for you to be able to get defensive rebounds and get out in transition. Like I think they're they're susceptible in transition because now you're making them have to guard space. Whereas, you know, they're, they're much better in close quarters where they can trap and overwhelm you. And so we'll, we'll show that on the film as well, where you have to manage your lanes when you run in transition to spread them out, to allow Terrence Shannon, to allow some of these other guys to get downhill and put pressure on the rim. Because really, like their rim rate and the way they protect the rim is not – it's not incredibly high. And, and the last point that I'll make is they are gettable on the offensive glass. You can, you can get them. Part of that is because they, they do force a lot of threes. So there's those opportunities to be had. But part of that is because they're in rotation yeah. and because they run around. There's going to be guys that have free runs to the rim. Ty Rogers, Quincy Garrier, um, Dane Danger. Particularly for a guy like Dane, when Hassan Ward's in the game, Terrence Shannon's driving, Marcus Damascus is driving. That is a guy that's going to detach from you to go block shots. We talked about that all the time with Kofi, mm-hmm. where it's like the, those – futile attempts to go and block shots like you better make sure you connect on them that's where they get killed on the offensive glass because he wants to go block shots he detaches from you and now you got dane danger coleman hawkins some of these other guys flying in to clean up and late it like that is to me that's the game right i know that's a lot of different keys but they're a really good team so you got to be you got to be good in all these different areas so um you know i i it's hard to sit here and be like you know I love the matchup, right? right? You know, you're not you're not playing a. I don't think either team does, right? Like, yeah, no, yeah, not, neither team does. There's team. There's things that Illinois does that um, hurts Iowa State because they're not efficient in those areas. And there's things Iowa State does that hurts Illinois. So, you know, it's and you could go across the board for all these matchups in the Sweet 16. Like there aren't teams like, especially with the way this tournament's played out and the matchups that we have. I mean, you're talking about there's some toss ups across the board. Mm-hmm. So. The last thing I'll say is you're coming into the Sweet 16. You're the number one offense in the country. You're playing extremely well. Like, you have earned the right to be confident in what you do in this game. Like, you've earned that right. Like, you can't come into this game and be, like, number one defense. Now we're on our heels. Now we're playing sped up. And, and I, like, fair warning to Illinois fans, Illinois is going to turn the ball over at some point. Like, it's, it's going to happen. It, it happened. I mean, Baylor beat, Baylor beat uh, Iowa State early in the year. They turned the ball over 20 times. 
Like it's just, that is just a part of their DNA and what they do. So don't get discouraged when you see that. But if you're Illinois, man, like you have every right to be confident. You have every right to, to feel like this is the next game on the schedule, take care of business. And, and we got, we got bigger things in mind and that, that should be the mindset. All right, Mike, since uh, we probably won't talk to you on the pod until next week, I just want to yeah. get your thoughts. If they are fortunate enough to advance the Elite Eight, I'm, I'm still in a Derek Burson, Brad Underwood term there. What do you think of Illinois versus UConn? Because I, I don't see the Huskies losing to San Diego State. As, as good as San Diego State is, UConn is a, a beast of a team. Yeah, I mean, you've got a couple of Final Four matchups in uh, in Boston, potentially. I mean, these are, these are two teams in Iowa State and UConn that very well could be playing for a you know, a title, a final four. Uh, and, and those are the, those are the teams you gotta, you gotta get through. I mean, UConn, they've lost one game since December 20th. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they have it all yeah. really. I mean, you go, you go down the line, whether it's Cam Spencer, you know, they got, you know, Castle, Tristan Newton. We just saw what, what Donovan Klingon did in that game against Northwestern 10 blocks. I mean, they, they have the rim protection, they have the shooting they have. And then, you know, they, they have one of the best tacticians, in in college basketball in um you know with with hurley i mean they they're you know their tempo is a little bit slower because what they do offensively is a lot of actions it's misdirections it's pin downs it's floppy action on the baseline it's hey we got our shooters coming off this way we got cling and roll into the back like they get there's a lot of really great stuff that they that they run so if you're fortunate enough to get past iowa state and uconn's fortunate enough that's to right. get past San Diego State, you know, it, it is going to be, man, I mean, you want to talk about a high, high, high level game. It's going to be, honestly, I mean, it's going to be the best team that that Illinois played in, I don't know how many years. Honest, honest to God, like, I don't know how many years it's been since Illinois would played a team this, you know, this good. Um, t- I, I, crazy to say, like, 05. I was going to say 2000. Like, UNC team, really, like, they're they're that good. So, you know, it'll be a challenge. Great stuff as always, Mike. Uh, can't wait to, to see these games, hopefully games, uh, in in Boston. But uh, what a run it's been, and uh, we'll continue to talk about it, whether it's the end of a season or previewing a Final Four next week, man. I'm hoping we're previewing some more teams, man. That'd be great. That'd be fun. Mike, it's up. You're the goods, man. Appreciate it.